Mark Lamont Hill. Pleasure to have you. Good to be here. Absolutely. We've been working on this for, what, maybe six months, nine months or so? <laughs> yeah, a lot going on, man. You know, getting schedules together, but I'm glad to finally uh, sit down and do it. Absolutely. You have a new book out. Yeah, man. I'm excited about it. Uh, it's called Nobody, uh, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint and beyond, man. I've been, I worked on it for a long time and I'm just really glad to get it out. Okay. Now, why'd you call it Nobody? You know, I got to Ferguson uh, the day after Mike Brown was killed and I was uh, looking around and I saw a town that was really still stunned by the shooting, stunned by the death, watching that boy lay out there for four and a half hours. It was like a lynching. Uh, back in the 19th, 20th century, you'd have lynchings and the whole town would watch the, the state execute somebody. It wasn't just about killing the person. It was about making sure that everybody saw what happens when you challenge authority. And they talked about what it meant to watch him lay out there. You know, his blood going through the concrete. You could smell death in the air. No medical establishment. No police came out there. They put a sheet over his body. Didn't even fit his body. He laid out there for four and a half hours. And one girl said to me, they left him out there like he ain't belong to nobody. And that stuck with me, that, like he ain't belong to nobody. And when I thought about Mike Brown's life, I realized that that nobodiness wasn't just about the police leaving him out there. It was also about the... Uh, the school district that failed him, Normandy School District. It was about the job market that had left when Emerson Electric left. It was about the public housing that never worked out in St. Louis and with Pru Pruitt Igo and all around the, the state. And then I kept trying to tell the story of Mike Brown. And right as I was writing a book proposal for that, we heard about Eric Garner and, and his killer not being uh, indicted. We, we saw uh, Freddie Gray die in Baltimore. We saw Sandra Bland die in Hempstead, Texas. We saw Walter Scott get shot in his back running away in Charleston. And after case after case after case, I kept seeing two things that were similar. A bunch of people that were treated like nobody and a bunch of, in, bunch of institutions that had abandoned them like nobody long before they got killed by the state. Yeah. I mean, when you see what's been happening, when you see, you know, and the comparison that a lot of people try to make is like, well, what about black on black crime? But when you look at black on black crime, the person doing it usually goes to prison. <laughs> whereas, yeah. whereas when you look at police on black crime, almost always the police officers walk away. That's exactly right. There's no shortage of black people in jail for killing black people. Uh, right. and, and at the very least, they get investigated, they get charged, there's an arrest, there's a grand jury indictment, there's all this stuff that doesn't happen, as you said, pointed out, when police kill us. The other thing is, with black on black crime, which is itself a, a funny term, right, a, a curious term, I mean, it's not about black on black, it's about proximity. It's, when people typically get, get killed by people who live in their neighborhoods. People don't go across town to murder people. people. White people get killed by white people. Asians get killed by Asians. That's just the norm. But we don't talk about white on white crime because we don't pathologize what white people do. White people do poorly on tests compared to Asians. But we don't say there's an Asian achievement gap, a white Asian achievement gap, right? We only talk about it when it comes to black folk. But even within that, you know, we do try to prevent black on black crime, quote unquote. We don't protest. We don't march for it. And people say, why aren't you out there marching against that? Well, because that's not how you stop black on black crime. You stop it by getting people jobs. You stop it by violence interruption. You stop it by mentoring people. You stop it through early education. You stop it through arts programs, music programs, sports programs. And that's the work we've been trying to do. And with police, we have a different expectation. I don't have an expectation that the Crips or the GDs or the Vice Lords or the Bloods are going to protect me. I, I didn't sign a contract with them. I don't pay taxes to the Bloods for them to take care of me. Now, I, I pay taxes to the police to take care of me, to protect me, to make sure that at least that they don't kill me. So I have a heightened expectation from them. The social contract says the police are supposed to protect and serve. We know historically they never have, but that's always been the goal. That's not my arrangement with Bloods and Crips. That's not my arrangement with, with people up the block shooting at each other. So it's a different expectation from the state. And I don't want anybody to kill me with impunity. And that's what the police are doing. They're killing us with impunity. They're killing us and nothing's being done about it. Well, let's talk about that for a second because when you look at the conviction rates of when cops kill people, and I'm not exactly sure what they are, but based on what you see over and over again, it almost seems like, you know, single digits. It you is know, single five, digits. Five, five, ten percent. So when you have that type of odds, you know what I'm saying? Just, just look at, like, for example, a, a Vegas odds. You know, <laughs> you're going to go to where the odds are higher. So if you know as a police officer you could kill someone and nothing's going to happen, you're going to be much less likely to think twice about committing these types of things. So what do you think is sort of the, the overall implication of, of that type of behavior? Right. And th that, that type of, um, you know, just situation when, when it happens, like they walk away from it. It's not even a slap on the wrist. It's not even a year in jail, five years in jail and so forth. Usually they get the jobs back, they get back pay and so forth. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. The first thing is we, we do have to acknowledge that all police killings or police involved shootings and killings are not um, the police in the wrong based on the law, right? In other words, sometimes they are defending themselves. Sometimes people are trying to kill them. So, so part of why the number is low is because some of them are quote unquote legit. And we can talk about what legit means. That's a deeper question, conversation as well. But that's part of the, the, the issue as well. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that in the last year or two, we've seen more convictions because there's more surveillance, there's more camera phones, there's more people witnessing it and having their witness trusted more. Um, even when black people get beaten, shot, and killed on tape, it doesn't mean there's gonna be a conviction, but it does increase the odds when that happens. And that's one of the things we're beginning to see. Um, I'm not convinced also that police necessarily have those odds in their head when they shoot people. I think it's even more messy and complicated than that. Um, even if more people went to jail for it, because remember, sometimes these cops have body cameras on and they're still killing us. The problem is that police operate from the same frameworks that we all do. We all have scripts in our minds of who and what people are. And unfortunately, one of our social scripts for black people is violence. So when you see Mike Brown walking down the street, you see violence, and if you're certain people. If, you're, if you see Trayvon Martin with nothing but Skittles and a hoodie, you still see violence. So if, I don't doubt, to be honest, that, that George Zimmerman thought Trayvon was guilty of something. And I don't doubt that he uh, thought that Trayvon was gonna hurt him. I don't doubt that. The problem is there was no reason to believe it. There was no rational basis for that. And then they go to court, and then there's a jury of his or her peers, and they're asked to invoke what we call the reasonable man or the reasonable person standard, which is what would a reasonable person do under these circumstances? So now you got 12 jurors who were sitting there saying, well, what would I do if I saw Trayvon? What would I do if I saw Mike Brown? And unfortunately, many of them would do the same thing. So now not only do we have a, a police officer who made a, a, a snap judgment that was underwritten by racism, but you have a jury that makes the same decision and doubles down on it, and you have a law that makes it all legal. So we have literally codified, we have made it legal, we have normalized white supremacist fear of black bodies. So the problem isn't just a bad cop, the problem isn't just uh, needing more cameras, the problem is the entire system is designed in such a way that it can't do anything but yield injustice to us. That's why we don't say anymore, I encourage people not to say that the system is broken, because that implies that we can tweak it, that we can reform it, that we can make it something other than it is. No, this, we need to stop saying that the system is broken and we need to make it work. We have to start saying the system is working and we need to break it. Well, you said in a, in a previous interview that you want to live in a society with no police at all. Yeah, that, that would be the ideal world for me. Okay, I mean, a, a lot of people raise their eyebrows when you said that. I mean, explain how that's even possible. Well, you don't begin there, right? You don't begin with the world without cops. Like, I'm not saying let's go to the worst neighborhoods in the city to all the cops to roll out and we live happily ever after. I'm, I'm talking about a, a bigger social imagination, a, a broader, more ambitious freedom dream than that. I'm saying we have to start with imagining a world without police and start by imagining a world without prisons and start by imagining a world where we invest and see people as sites of investment in love rather than containment and blame. If we begin from there, then we begin to do the things necessary. So before I have a world without cops, I need a world where uh, we invest in things that make people less likely to commit crime. Food, clothing, shelter, early literacy, head start, uh, getting lead out of the environment, getting uh, carbon emissions out of the environment. I'm just thinking of places like Flint, Michigan right now in case people think I'm tripping. Like we got rid of lead in the 70s. Nah, not in Flint, not in Cleveland, not in Baltimore, not in, not in Pennsylvania. So creating environmental standards that are safer, creating educational options that are better, creating uh, resources for people who are on the wrong side of, of, of American social life. For example, people who are drug addicted, treating that as a medical problem rather than a criminal problem. Because quite frankly, when white people get addicted to crystal meth or when their kids end up strung out on heroin, America suddenly says, oh my God, we need to treat these people instead of throwing them in a cage. But they didn't do that with black folk. We need that for everybody. So if we invest in these things, that creates a different type of environment. And then we don't need the prison in the same way. I'm not saying that nothing, but one more thing, I'm not saying any, nothing bad will happen. I'm not saying that we don't need to address things, but we can have an entirely different social arrangement in the long term, whereby we police our own communities, whereby we have a different relationship to our own community and to justice so that we don't have an occupying force from the outside coming in, but instead we police ourselves from the inside. I mean, right, because I interview a lot of a lot of rappers. Like for example, I just interviewed Lil Bibby. Yeah. And, and he he told me with a straight face, "You mean to tell me 
that if I walked up to your mother right in front of you and shot her in the face, yeah. and then I, I left the country and you could never, you can't get to me, you Hell wouldn't no. tell the police. Hell no, I'm, I'm a, I'm, where your mama stay at? <laughs> Is she in the neighborhood? So you kind of see this to a certain regard, but I feel that sort of the fundamentals of it have been kind of twisted up. Right. I mean, that, that, a lot of that comes out of the, the, the logic of no, not snitching, right? And yeah. there's a lot of reasons why people are reluctant to engage the police. Now, I would argue that if there's a rapist in the community and you call the police to stop the rapist, you're not snitching, right? There, there's a distinction between snitching and witnessing. I agree. I don't want anybody to snitch. I believe you should not snitch. Snitching means that if you and I commit a crime together and one of us get caught, you don't go telling. You eat that time. You eat that case. That's what that's what snitching is about. It's not snitching when someone comes and sets your house on fire and burns up your grandmama, as what happened in Baltimore. And you you don't have to you don't have to sit on that. There's nothing wrong with you telling somebody, right? That's not snitching. Now I understand that people don't have a good faith relationship to the police, so they don't trust what's going to happen when they call the police. They don't trust that the person's going to get a fair shake. I mean, if somebody graffitied on my house right now in Philly, I wouldn't call the police. One, because I don't trust the police, and two, because I worry that what they would do to the young man who graffitied on my house would be so far beyond what should happen that it wouldn't be justice either. So there are a lot of reasons why people don't want to engage and trust the police. But what we have to do is think even bigger than that immediate reactionary moment, right? And we have to say, okay, well, if, if there is a serial killer in the community, if there is a rapist in the community, how do we handle it in ways that don't bring more violence to the community, that don't bring more police ultimately to the community, but also get justice? Because it's not just about me not wanting the rapist in the community, it's about making the victim whole again. It's about making the survivor whole again and making creating a world where the survivor is okay. And that means coming up with new ways of resolving injustice. That means community-based dispute resolution. That means restitution. That means community service. That means uh, paying money back for other in other ways beyond and literally giving people their stuff back. Say you steal somebody's TV. These are ways that you can make people whole again that don't involve the prison, that don't involve the jail, and don't involve the criminal justice system as we currently imagine it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm trying to imagine a world without prison. But remember, the person running through the hood raping people or shooting people as a serial killer has a mental health issue. I'm not saying give them a slap on the wrist, say give us the money back and go back home. I'm saying that person needs to probably, probably be some kind of secured mental health confinement. They need to be treated. You can't go around raping people or molesting people or killing people and not have a severe mental health issue. I'm saying let's treat the issue. Let's get justice. Let's make the world whole. But the problem is we have grown into a world where we confuse justice with punishment and punishment with confinement. So we can't imagine justice any other way but putting somebody in a cage. There has to be something bigger than that. Right. I mean, I don't know if you saw the, there's a 60 Minutes special about the German prison system. Did mm. you ever see that? Yeah. And Swedish. There's, there's, a, there's one in Sweden yeah, too. It, yeah. it, was, it was mind blowing because, you know, they, they talked to the head of the German prison system and his thing was nobody is above rehabilitation. You know, every single prison guard has three years of training and we treat every person like a human being. And they showed the actual prison cells in Germany where you had your own key to the cell. You know, you had a TV. It almost looked like a college dorm room in yeah. a way. You know, you had darts in there, you know, and they didn't even think to use it as a weapon. But when you look at the, the U.S. prison system, it's, it's a night and day difference. I mean, like the, 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 the COs are completely untrained. There's an animosity between the COs and the prisoners. So you kind of establish a certain level that, you know, if you really take a step back, it hasn't really been working. And no, it, it hasn't been. Yeah. Because the goal of prison in the United States is very different. Uh, in my book, Nobody, uh, which again is out in stores right now, one of the things I talk about in the fifth chapter of that book is uh, the prison and how it came about. You know, when the prison came about, it really came, it's a, in many ways a very American thing. There were other forms of punishment that were similar, but they were very different than what the Americans came up with. We had this idea, and the Quakers in particular had an idea that prison could be something that could be rehabilitative. We came up with the idea of the penitentiary, and at the root of the word penitentiary is penitence. The idea was that you could pay penitence, that you could give penitence, that you could uh, atone for your sins. And so the Quakers decided that they'd create a space where you'd go to this place and you'd reflect. They gave them a Bible, they gave them a bed, they read, they reflected, and they came out into the world better citizens. The problem is when Eastern State Penitentiary was created and these other penitentiaries were created, they weren't created for black and brown folk. And they weren't connected to the economic logic of America. This was a purely a, a project about making white people whole again. Then suddenly, when black folk start going to jail, it's a whole other thing. It's no longer about rehabilitation, it's about exploitation. Remember, the prison begins 
after uh, after slavery. You know, you had all these people on all these plantations, all these farms who were making money. America is built on the exploitation of black labor. America is built on slave labor. So slavery ends, and suddenly the slave codes turn into black codes, right? Because the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, right? But it only abolishes slavery except under the condition of prison. In other words, if you commit a crime, if you're incarcerated, according to the 13th Amendment, slavery is still allowed. So you're technically a slave if you're in prison. Absolutely. You can legally be told what to do. Your labor can be forced, etc. So if, if, no, if, if nobody's a, if you, So think about it like this. You need slaves for, to keep the economy going. You don't have slaves anymore unless people commit a crime. So what do you do? You make everything a crime. So suddenly mm -hmm. the slave codes became the black codes. So now mm -hmm. black people can be arrested for vagrancy, for standing outside, for cursing in front of a woman, for being out of town without a job. All of these things, which are fairly arbitrary crimes, or if crimes at all, they take them and they throw them back into the prison. And then they have something called the convict lease system, where the prison can lease the convicts out to the same plantations they left to do the same work that they did as slaves. So now the slaves have become free only to become slaves again through prison. And that is wow. a system that we're dealing with right now, a, a, a new version of the convict lease system. And that's why labor is exploit, exploited. And that's why prisons have become even more for profit. That's why we see more privatization, because people make, a money, make money in this country of exploited labor. And this is one example of it. What do you think about the whole situation? Man, my point of view, man, I really feel like they tried to paint a, a bad picture on my brother and tried to make him look like, like he was a hater. Uh, it was some envy, jealousy type shit, you know what I'm saying? And actuality, you know what I'm saying? Bro, been having this shit, man. He been in the condo. I got my hat on and I had my Coke bottles up under my hat. And I'm sitting at the dinner table like an asshole with the hat on, knowing she gonna tell me to take it off. And I'm just sitting there just gawping down, you know, in my zone. She said, take that goddamn hat off at the dinner table. I'm like, come on, mom. Coke everywhere. 